This is George Dion with Metal Express Radio, and I'm here with musician and solo artist David Reese. David, how are you doing today? Greetings, George. Nice to see your face. Good to see you. Uh, if I knew absolutely nothing about David Reese, how would you describe your solo music to me? Uh, real. <laughs> it's coming from the heart, man. I mean, that's it. That's all I can say. I, uh, I'm uh, having a great time at it and um, blessed to be able to keep singing and then I don't know. I've been on a pretty good run with ideas for the last few years, so hope it keeps happening. <laughs> Absolutely. And I was a big fan of Cacophony of Souls. I hadn't listened to your solo work before. It is a fantastic album. You're following <laughs> up with another fantastic album, Blacklist Utopia. It comes out on October 29th on El Puerto Records. Uh, yep. You say it's not a political album, but you certainly touch upon some social issues that, that are going on around us today. I do, and uh, I'm a, a sensitive person to that. Uh, I'm an American living in Italy, and I actually, uh, where all the George Floyd stuff went down, was about five minutes from where I spent about 10 or 15 years of my life, started my music career. Um, I don't condone that man being killed by a policeman, and especially watching three cops, you know, while he's doing it. But that neighborhood that was burned to the ground is where I. My aunt and uncle are both disabled, and I, I I had to do a lot of work for them to go get food and all that stuff. Those places are gone. And that neighborhood was was kind of that old-style city village feeling vibe in that area. And watching it be burned to the ground really, really got to me. And I was worried about my aunt as well, because my uncle since passed. But a lot of my friends, you know, were telling me what was happening. And, yeah, it messed with my head. But, the, you know, regarding that track, I Can't Breathe, that, that that's a spin on that what that whole mantra or whatever it was but it's not about him it's about me feeling choked by what's going on in media because god i don't know <laughs> what's true and what's not anymore you know <laughs> i feel the same way david it's tough to tell who's telling the truth and 2020 and 2021 certainly gave you a lot to write about i mean yeah i believe utopia is about kind of the new normal that we're living in correct well, yeah, I mean, the title itself, the album title, Blacklist Utopia, you know, falls back in line with what you just asked me or mentioned that I watch. I mean, I, I'll, I'll mention what happened last summer. I was attacked being called a racist. And, uh, you know, 90 percent of my family is mixed race from native blood to black, you know, Hispanic. I mean, it just really got to me how that even came out. It was actually somebody who was booking me in a chat room and it got leaked back to me. I was being attacked. Uh, so, you know, you voice an opinion about what you see what's happening and you're not really attacking that person, you know, but there's this whole army that comes after you. And then if you go along with the other army, they're attacked, you know, this, your army is attacking them when it's, I'm not really in an army. It's just me watch, you know, what's going on. So I called it the blacklist utopia. And, and I always ask myself, what utopia is, is a human race seeking? And if they do achieve what they're thinking about, will they be satisfied anyways? And that 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 all just kind of came to me one day. And I was thinking, what what where is this going? I mean, you want to rip down a statue of history. Did you change your world that, that day? Is everything OK now? No. And so I think personally, that, uh, you know, the Internet, there's a lot of fake outrage and mm -hmm. people can be fake outraged um, on the Internet because they don't see anybody face to face. And clearly right. 2021 was the year we didn't see each other face to face. So that kind of kind of like blew up. Uh, sometimes I think it's sort of a game to see who can one up and say, I did this. You see that guy that got canceled? I did that. Yeah, you're right. It's vicious. It's. Uh... It, it all played into the hand of, of evil, you know, not being able to be face to face. Uh, we're only able to look at each other like we are right now because we're on restriction. We can't go outside. We can't do anything socially. Uh, I think it was perfect breeding ground for exactly what you said. And, and uh, you, you kind of cover our less freedoms and kind of not coming together on the songs, um, not a couple songs, Civil War. It's kind mm -hmm. of where we're in fighting amongst each other. American dream. You're kind of like we should be coming together. Stuff like stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I hope it has a 
I mean, it, it, it's it's a sad but positive at the same time. I mean, I, I the American Dream came to me with with Andy uh, that I saw a photo of the Statue of Liberty with the twin towers in front of her, and one was collapsing and one was on fire. And just the intensity of that photo, whoever took it from the bridge, it blew my mind. And then, you know, that line in the song, uh, the lady on the island, I used to know her name. Now she's just a puppet on a string. You know, I, kind of a hokey line, I guess, but it, it means a lot to me. And, and, you know, civil war is, you know, I, I'm hearing, you know, the United States of California, the United States of New York. I'm here in the United States of Texas. We've come full circle in many ways. People aren't, aren't that smart <laughs> you know, to see what's going on. I mean, and, and it, it, I think the little blow on Hell's Kitchen one day, because once we're able to get back out into society, there's a lot of pent up, like you said, maybe it's fake on the Internet, but there are people out there that are just fed up. They're fed up. I mean, look I at the music. You. I'm trying to I'm trying to sell records, and and now I'm being told that there's cargo issues in the United States, shipping. Yeah. I mean that that's you know I mean what else could go wrong? I lose my venues. I lose a tour for Cacophony. I'm locked down in Italy. It literally exploded 30 minutes from my house is where it all began here in Europe. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm being po postponed 50,000 times into where I don't even want to turn on the internet and find out what bad news I'm going to get. You know, and uh, I don't know where I was going with that. I apologize, but <laughs> I'll steer ahead. you a little. I'll steer you a little bit. I'll say this. I don't know about you where you live, but where I live, I live in New England. I live in Massachusetts. And okay. most of the stuff I see on television or the Internet isn't going on around me like mm -hmm. this, this, this people not treating each other as equal. I really don't see that. Maybe I live in some sort of bubble, but I think in real life, Facebook and the media likes to amplify that. Or yeah. I don't see the people yelling at people for not doing what the government wants them to do. I don't see that in real life. My neighborhood, you know, we all talk to each other. We all have different backgrounds. I really just don't see this social class. Maybe in the cities, it's a little different, but sometimes it goes with that internet thing. Some people want to say that I'm responsible for that protest or I'm responsible for that media coverage. Yeah. I mean, great. I'm happy that you are, you know, like you said, I can sit over here in America and, and turn on all of the satellite news agencies. And um, there's like eight of them, you know, just terrible. And then there's one fighting back against that. And, you know, it, it literally got to where my wife said, stop watching television. And it's been healthy for me because, you know, I just live my life and try to write songs and, and try to stay positive every day, you know, and uh, keep faith that, that this is all going to come together somehow. And uh, I got my health, you know, I'm talking exactly. to you about music and then what we love. And uh, I'm, I'm honored to be able to do that. And I'm blessed that I have the opportunity to do this. So that's what matters. Absolutely. Uh, you've had, some co-writers on this album, your longtime partner, Andy Susamil, writes mm -hmm. a lot of the album with you. You also had a song co-written by Jimmy Waldo of Alcatraz. Yep. How do you and Jimmy know each other? Uh, we met uh, through my manager, uh, Giles Lavery, and uh, of course he manages Alcatraz. And what had happened with that was it grew into, it blossomed into another um project which is called the highway sentinels that jimmy waldo and steve rosen i don't know if you're familiar with steve but he was uh, i believe a writer for uh, guitar world and rolling stone uh he would interview all the great guitar players and say one day i'm going to do an album and i want you to play on it and they're like sure and uh jimmy finally came together with steve on that and now i'm i've written nine songs on that that this album that include Joe Satriani and Paul Gilbert and, and Kane Robertson and uh, Bumblefoot. So I'm in the company of Kings. I mean, it's such an honor. So working with Jimmy, he's such a, I mean, from the New England days to Alcatraz. I mean, I saw him when they had Graham in the band and Ingve was in the band in Milwaukee at a record riot <laughs> at like two o'clock in the afternoon. And remember the record riots, they'd have a tent and then bands would play. And then after the bands were ch you know, changing sets, You'd run them by all the posters and all the uh, cassettes and vinyl at that time and then go back and see the next band. So I would met Jimmy probably in 82 or something like that. And uh, 
Yeah, he's just a real sincere guy. You know, he knows everybody. And he's a great <laughs> musician. He's a great musician. Absolutely. He's a pretty down to earth guy, too. I've talked to him a couple times. Oh, yeah. Uh, on Civil War, you co wrote that with Roland Grappau from Halloween and Master Plan. Um, did you guys know each other prior? Vaguely. Um, that all came together, too. I'm, I'm kind of covering some, I'm, I'm bouncing around here. We can talk about other projects if you don't mind to tie all that yeah. together. Absolutely, because I got questions about those, too. Okay. Well, this goes back to where Herman Frank and I from Accept, they're doing Iron Allies. Mm -hmm. And uh, Herman reached out to me and I said, you know, it'd be funny. The two guys that used to be in the same band, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he said, I would first choose Roland Grappau to be the alternate guitarist. So we had spoken to Roland and he's wrapped up in master plan and a bunch of stuff. And that we started writing together and uh, that track came out. And then it didn't work out where Roland was going to be with us. So I said, I like the song. I'm keeping it. I think it fits. So Roland said, no problem. You know, put it out there. But that's how I met Roland. I don't really know him that well, but, you know, we've Skyped a blue million times. I think he was in Czech Republic and he's moved back to Germany now. Okay. Did you ever find that second guitarist for Iron Allies or is it just going to be Herman? We are going to look for that guy. Um we have Donny von Stavern from Riot on bass, and we have Francesco Giovino on drums, who did Blacklist Utopia. Um, yeah, it's it's going to have definitely have to be two two guitars. I mean that that's traditional. I mean, and but I think Herman will be more of the showcase solo guitarist in the group because he's so underrated. I mean, you know, he's in the band with Wolf for years, and he didn't really get the spotlight he deserved. The guy's a phenomenal guitar player and writer. And uh, this will be his baby to showcase that. Kind of like he's doing solo and, and with victory, you know. Right, exactly. Um, your Blacklist Utopia kind of has a unique uh, packaging. You do like these steel boxes. You did the same thing with Cacophony. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty unique. I think fans like stuff like that. Is that kind of your idea behind it? Or is the the label that, that does those things? It was the label, actually. And, and I... I think it was pretty cool, but what's frightening about it is they only make like say a hundred of them, and you hope that the fans that you know that can't get the box because they're all sold now still buy the physical product when it comes out, you know, in America when it's scheduled and blah blah blah. That's the only downside to it. I mean, I think they're a great idea, but you can't make you know five thousand of them at, at that price because they're they're a little more expensive than a, than than the physical product. I think it's a cool thing. That's good for man caves. I've got my little collection of those things on my piano and, you know, my past. It's kind of cool. The looky loos, I call them, you know. There you go. A little conversation yeah. pieces. Yeah, yeah. So Cacophony Tour didn't happen because of the pandemic. Is mm -hmm. a tour behind this album kind of being planned for next year? Hey, I, I just lost Norway. <laughs> Four dates this week. Yeah. I just lost Spain the end of uh, November which looked really good, both yeah. both tours. 2021's gone. Uh, we're trying to roll over into next year, but with the Herman Frank thing, and, and uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not in a lack of material, put it that way. I could go out with Herman and, and Iron Allies, and we could do Accept, we could do, you know, Riot, we could do David Reese solo, we could do Victory, we could do a set of the best songs that we've had success with and play an hour and a half. But... We're focused on that, um, and there's a couple few other gigs for me solo, but I got to tell you, you know, there, there's so many, and you've probably heard this a million times, there's there's guys that, my guitar player, for instance, refuses to be vaccinated. Uh, that puts me in a bit of a spot. Um, I respect his choice, um, but I got to find a guy to replace him. You know what I mean? I mean, it's yeah. it's, it's every yeah. it's everything, dude. I mean, uh, venues are at 33 percent. I think some of them they're wanting to pay less because they don't have more people. They can't charge the 33 percent of people more at the door because of the limitations. So a lot of a lot of the clubs that are in Europe that I'm I'm talking to are saying, well, I've got this local band that play here every four weeks that bring 200, 300 of their, of their friends and they buy me out a beer and they play for free. 
And they're really good young bands. And I think that's great. But a guy like me who's used to making a living and has a crew and everybody else to worry about, I got to be paid for my work. So it's put a bit of a damper on things. It's, it's affected everything. I would imagine there's sort of a, a tier system, too, when it comes to setting up these gigs after the big break where, you know, the gigantic promoter is going to get first preference. And then, oh, yeah. you know, it's going to work its way down until, you know, it kind of gets to the club guys and the amphitheater guys and stuff. Yeah, like that. I mean, you got at the bottom of every big promotion that I'm seeing right now, all acts subject to change due to COVID-19. I mean, you've got Judas Priest and all these huge bands that are, you know, two years behind waiting for festivals. You know, the people that purchase the tickets for it, they're going to obviously do those first. But uh, if you look at the list as the names get smaller, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're not in the big, big <laughs> limelight marquee. You're getting your name gets about an inch long at the bottom. And it says out of the 30 bands, everything is subject to change. And so that 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 magical call could come, you know, tonight for me. You know, it, you never know. But I'm working at it. You know. Yeah. At least creativity wise, you can kind of focus on writing music, right? Yeah. I'm, I actually last night I was asked by an Australian guy to do synth metal. And I've never done anything like that. And it was really <laughs> tough for me, man, because... I'm used to crunching guitars and stuff, and this stuff is programmed synthesizers where guitars should be. But the outcome of it was great. I mean, I was like, wow, this is pretty pretty cool. So it was a challenge. But yeah, I'm, I'm able to, to write. Um, I've made some, I, I kind of fell in a black hole during COVID for about a month. Uh, but I pulled myself out of it and said, I'm gonna write. And I got lucky because I got some of those projects offered to me. Now, I know I have said prior in the press that I'm not going to be the band guy. I'd rather be a solo artist. But, you know, when Herman reached out to me, I was like, you know what? This could be really cool. You know, I'll manage my solo career, but I need to be in a band with a bunch of name guys who have played the game, who have a fan base, each of us, that promoters kind of go, you know, I'm interested in that. I want to see that live. I want to. That'll sell tickets. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So I will continue to write for other people and myself. Do you have an idea of when your album with Iron Allies is going to be released? No. There's 22 recorded tracks right now. Okay. And Herman and I and the guys have kind of said, well, let's pick the best 13 or 14. Um, we're kind of all stuck at home doing our parts. Yeah. Francesco's doing uh, live drums right now on our, our record company demo. We're picking like the seven of the best ones just to kind of flash. We might release the single first to give everybody a taste of it. Cause we got the logo design and all that done. We got the photos and all that done and the artwork. So we might just like, kind of like what uh, Ellison and those guys did with Lucid. They released yep. a few singles, give a taste of it, base that on the response, you know, kind of thing. We talked about that. I, I got to call Herman tonight actually. But he's got a bad cold, so he's kind of grouchy. <laughs> <laughs> so Herman was in Accept, and you were in Accept for an album, and Udo was the original singer of Accept. And I was talking to him last week, and he mentioned that you actually opened for him. Was there any awkwardness there, or was it like, hey, let me tell you about this, let me tell you about that? I can tell you that when I took the job, he was doing Mean Machine at the same time in the same studio, nice. 1988. The man always put his hand across the table and made me feel welcome. Um, the Steel Factory Tour, I had just released Resilient Heart, that solo album. And I pick up the phone and called his manager. I said, hey, I see you're going out with Udo on Steel Factory. He goes, you know, I was just talking about you today, Dave. And Udo, how cool it would be to have you as a special guest. And I went, okay. Let's make a deal. Uh, I think we did about 35 gigs together. And I mean, I was in the bathroom warming up and he was sitting on the toilet. And I looked down, I could see the shoes and I said, that's probably Udo. And, he, and I was going, da 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 And he goes, shut up. Stop with that stupid warming up. You don't need to do that race. Stop. You're making me a headache. And he opened the door and came out and gave me a big hug. And, and I said, hey, man, it was like I hadn't just seen him the day before. His son is playing drums with him, obviously, now. And, and his son used to open for me when I was doing Bangalore choir shows in Europe. 
he had a band called Damage. Yeah. And they, they would bring like 100, 200 kids there that they grew up with. It was amazing. Great little pop metal band. And he was coming along and, and really playing well. And uh, then I heard he went out as uh, Glockler's uh, drum tech with Saxon. And he got to do some shows for Saxon. Uh, and I think Udo was waiting for him to kind of blossom to get that skill to where he could bring him in and say, my son is behind me bashing drums. So it was a great tour. Really, I can't say enough about him. I mean, he's always been great to me. And we have a lot in common with our history. So, yeah. That's, that's good. And I, I think, you know, he's had a longer solo career than he ever had with yeah. Except. You know, it's funny with Except. They were doing, uh, he was doing Back to the Roots. And they were out with, I think, the second album, Stalingrad or something. And he was out selling Except. Promoters and the fans were choosing Udo doing Back to the Roots Except songs then except touring except and you know they they were supposed to be like a two-week thing and it turned out to be two years and he yeah. was telling me he goes i just kept getting phone call after phone call hey can you do russia can you do japan yeah let's keep going you know and of course certain people that were behind except were calling and say hey could you just take a break so we could sell some tickets he's like nope <laughs> i'm not doing it i'm going with it you know yeah, I saw that show, the Dirk Schneider show, and it was it was really good. And uh, he still yeah. performed at top of his game. Yeah. Um, let's go back a little bit in the time machine with you. You mentioned Bangalore Choir, uh, 1992. You had the album on Target. I saw on uh, streaming that your albums with Bangalore Choir have been re-released or put out there with bonus live tracks and stuff like that through global rock records. First yep. question is, do you, do you have a hand in this or has the catalog kind of been sold around? Uh, I got a hand in it with uh, Giles Lavery, the guy that manages Alcatraz. He brought it to global. And um, I recently just dug up and I got really lucky. I found all the tracks that didn't make that record on target. And I, I'm, I, I mean, we did it at AM at night, A&M and studios in Hollywood, and you can hear us talking in the background. And stuff. So I found all these great tracks that I co-wrote with Steve Plunkett from Autograph, all this stuff that I was begging the record company to release. And they said, no, it's not right for radio. Of course, they never know what they're talking about, but we remixed it, mastered it. So there's kind of like that going on. And then you have bonus tracks that you never heard before. So yeah, I was, I was instrumental in that. I mean, I, I mean, that album, it's weird because I, it came out huge. And a month later, I was told that my life was over and, you know, get a day job. I mean, I was most added to radio. I mean, the video, Loaded Gun, that's Jared Leto, the boy in the video. I mean, okay. I've, I'm in the modeling agency picking boys and they're picking girls. And he walked in dressed like James Dean with his mom. And I said, that guy. Turns out it's Jared Leto. You know where he is now. Yeah. Um, and I ran into him once at a 30 Seconds to Mars show, and I said, you remember me? And he's staring at me backstage, and he had this orange mohawk, and I'm a fan of his movies and everything. And I, his band was killer. And I, I said, do you remember a band called Bangalore Choir and a video called Loaded Gun? And his eyes got huge, and he started screaming, oh, my God. And he grabbed the band, and they're like, this is my first acting gig, this guy right here. And I'm, like, standing there all proud, you know, like, yeah, my boy made it. But – uh you know, that, that album, it, it came and went so fast because I had the accept momentum of Eat the Heat. So when I went back to L.A., I said, you know what? I'm going to conquer, man. We played nine shows in about six months, and I had an offer from every label in, in town, every major label. And I went with Giant Warner Brothers because, you know, Irving Azoff was behind it, and I had Howard Kaufman from Whitesnake managing us. And... um. As soon as it started, it was over. And we had some pretty good little tours that we did. And But unbeknownst to me was, is that grunge had not really affected the, the UK or Europe yet. So right. the album was thriving over here. And I played Firefest <laughs> in 2010. And I, I, can, I can tell you, everybody, I said, it took 19 years to see you guys play. Why did you give up? And I said, I was told it was over. No, dude, the album was huge here. It was huge there. If I'd have just put the band on an airplane and gypsy it, we could have probably maintained a few more years of life. I made a mistake because I was told by the big shots, give it up. Rock is dead. 
Well, I think in addition to being big over in Europe, I think the internet has brought back kind of these lost gems that got lost in the in the shuffle with the internet. You know, everybody can push what they got. And back when you were starting out, the record label decided who got pushed and who didn't. It was kind of a fan response or a sales response, but I think that on target has certainly come around as more as as it's aged more people are finding it and the same with eat the heat i i think yeah. that anybody that's coming across that now is like wow this is a really good album but in 1990s uh you're like well it's not udo but it's still a good album they did a re-release of that album uh 2000 limited orange vinyl and it was actually coincided with uh steel factory tour yeah i signed that thing every night i know those copies were gone and i had more than I can tell you, say, I really wanted to hate your guts. You destroyed my band. Well, I didn't destroy your band. They hired me. I didn't hire myself. And they go, I know. This is a classic record. Would you please sign it? I love it. And during that tour, I played Ecstasy and, uh, you know, Sven joined me on drums. And I played Hellhammer and, and D-Train and those songs. And everybody would just light up. They, ah, This is it. Because, you know, songs like, you know, Prisoner and stuff like that, they don't really work. That was too soft for Accept. It was a, one of those records that 32 or 33 years later gets more attention now than it did then. And that says something. I mean, Bangalore Choir is the same thing. People, I mean, I've got people calling me, writing me. Do you have original un, open open packages and blah, blah, blah. It's $500 here on this side. And I'm like, What? <laughs> but, I wish that would have come into fruition when I released it, but you know, better late than never, right? <laughs> and, and it does say something because I don't think that the bands that followed you, at least most of them, are going to have the same recognition 20, 30 years down the road. You know, I don't think everybody's clamoring to see Limp Biscuit or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, that was that was a weird one. I mean, that was kind of one of those novelty acts that came out during the, you know, I said to myself, I went to see Soundgarden at the palace and I was blown away. Plaster was falling off the ceiling. And I thought, this guy looks like Jesus Christ. He sings like God. This guy's amazing. This band is going to be huge. And they were. And then, you know, this little band called Alice in Chains came out and they opened for Van Halen, you know, went round and round. And all those songs were pound cake and all that was huge. I thought, oh, my God, they got one Marshall stack, a bass rack, and this guy singing his ass off. So I bought every album they had. I never really was a big Nirvana guy until I got older, and then I realized how good it really was. But I really wanted to hate their guts, but there was some great stuff that came up. But I remember telling myself, this is about a three- or four-year cancer on the music business, that we needed to have chemo treatment because every lead singer dyed his hair blonde, including myself. And followed David Lee Roth's footsteps with, you know, that whole tapping thing. And, you know, nothing was real. And people were like, I've had enough. And it just kind of struck a nerve with that generation of people that single parent homes, heroin addiction, all that stuff. Boom. And how many of those bands are still around now? Pearl Jam and the Chili Peppers. Everybody else is dead. It's weird. Good point. Contrell, Contrell, he just released a brilliant album. I mean, the guy's a genius, and the, he feel the heartache from losing Lane. I mean, that that team together were amazing. But I, he he's still doing it, and I, I I admire him greatly. I saw him right after Lane had died, and yeah. what are you going to say? And then I went to uh, a uh, Metal Edge magazine party on a train to somewhere in Mexico, and Michael, the bassist, was on the, the train, and he was in bad shape. And we had, like, a basketball game with stars, and, and the guy was not doing well. And then he passed. So it's weird. And then, you know, we just lost, you know, Chet and, and Chris, and, yeah, weird. Okay. Are you working on any other musical projects besides Iron Allies and your solo stuff and that guitar project you mentioned? Yeah, I'm actually, I spent, maybe I'm just rambling too much. Tell me to shut up whenever you like, but. I dig it all, man. Oh, good. Then I can ramble a little more. Um, I'm really good at that. But anyways, the little squirrels in my head that are dancing around with storing nuggets of ideas and stuff. I, I ran into Mike Onesco. Are you familiar with him? 
Uh, I'm not sure. Blindside Blues Band. It's a blues band, hard rock, kind of free, bad company, humble pie thing. And that's where I came from. I'm 61 years old. I grew up with that. And yep. he started sending me these tracks. And uh, I'd heard about him from a guitar player I worked with for a while. And I just went in and started singing. And it was like so easy and natural. Now, I spent a lot of my career emulating David, uh, David Coverdale. And I don't know why I did that, because I could kind of do it well. But I always thought I needed a Hammond and a guitar player and the, the ready and willing kind of thing. And up to still of the night, I spent four or five records of my life doing that. And then finally, I've, I've gotten to the point now where my identity is me. You know, I don't have to sing like that. I, that's been done a hundred million times. So it's going to be Michael Nesco and I. Uh, we got about eight songs recorded. That'll come out next year. I think we're going to finalize everything in December. And then I did a record with an Italian guy named Stefano Viana. He's pretty well known over here. And we wrote a bunch of stuff. Francesco's playing drums on that as well. But um, yeah, that's right now. That's what I'm doing. But I'm, I'm really focused with Herman, too, trying to solidify that and promote Blacklist Utopia. Because that's that's who I am. You know, I'm a hard rock singer. So. Absolutely. And Blacklist Utopia is a fantastic album. Comes out Thank October 29th. Uh, I've listened to it several times. I love it. I love it as much as I love Cacophony. That was a wow. good one. Took me a little while to pronounce Cacophony, but I got it. <laughs> so yeah, that, I'm sorry. It's my fault. <laughs> it's okay. But I should have known it because of the band Cacophony with uh, Marty Friedman and uh, Jason Becker. But, you know, I completely forgot. Yeah, that that was kind of brought to my attention a few times. And I said it was not in, it was unintentional, believe me, because you couldn't touch that madness. I remember <laughs> those guys when they were hanging around L.A. and it was like, I don't know what drugs they're on, but they're ripping, burning guitar fretboards, you know. Absolutely. Well, that's all I got for you today, David. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with Metal Express Radio. Thank you, George. And, and thanks to all your listeners. And uh, I dig that little uh, ornament hanging on the wall behind your head there. Um, yeah, Cross. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that because I am as well. Yeah, um, it's, it's tough in today's world, you know what I mean? Yeah, man, but don't lose faith, bro. And absolutely, uh, you love one another, and and just like I said, this record ha touches on a lot of topics. Um, but I hope people can kind of it's it's sub it's subjective, right? So however you interpret it, that's what I want to happen. I don't want baby, baby, whoa, whoa lyrics. Because <laughs> there's a time and place for that. But, you know, listen, you know. Exactly. Listen and educate and, you know, converse. You know, you, converse. you're not going to agree. People, people aren't going to agree with each other. But, you know, you can respect what I mean, at least me growing up, you can respect where they're coming from. Yeah. And that's the way I was raised. And whatever you do, you're going to do it the best and be the best at whatever it is. And don't, there's nothing wrong with having integrity. And I hope when this is over that if, if, if I don't sell a record, they'll throw a beer can in my grave, you know, and, the, and say, he wrote some good songs. You know, he gave it at all. That, that's what I, that's the only thing I would say. I did my best, you know. Absolutely. And that's all any of us can do. That's right. Thank you, George. <laughs>